So how, so how can I possibly respond to a secret complaint? We have indicated what is part of the complaint. There's not a word in here from the complaint. This is your words. Yes, so frustrating, but here's the weirdest part. We all know that writing books during elections is not illegal. In fact, that's when many political books are published. There were plenty of pro-Trudeau books published at the same time as mine. The Election Act specifically exempts books and the promotion of books from the law. And in their threat letter to me, they actually quote the section that proves I'm exempt. Look at this. I have never seen a letter of accusation, a threat letter before, from any public authority that contains within it a defense against the accusation. Uh, I'm talking about... Jill, a single mom locked out at the co-op refinery, a refinery that makes $3 million a day. Last year, Federated Cooperatives Limited earned more than $9.2 billion, and now this massive conglomerate is breaking a promise. Co-op is gutting the pensions of their loyal, hardworking employees by half. What are we to do but fight against a greedy corporate bully? It's like David and Goliath, but this time you can help the underdog win. Go to boycottcoop.ca. A message from Unifor. So welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. Sorry about the sound quality. This is going to be a little bit of a different podcast. Normally, I bring you information and news about the world and what's going on in my life. I'm Jeff Cliff. And to give you an alternative to something else to listen to, something else to watch than the Super Bowl, something else to listen to than the IFPI, the RIA, the MPAA, Netflix, Spotify, and other forms of corporate media. What you just heard uh, at the beginning, the two clips, the first is a, and we're gonna get right into this, an excerpt from a video. The video unfortunately is not Creative Commons, so I can only use little bits and clips of it, uh, which are hopefully fair enough to not get snagged from the content ID bot at YouTube uh, from one Ezra Levant, who's such a shit disturber, uh, but is in trouble again, this time for publishing a book, tentatively due to publishing it during an election time, during the last election. Now, this is not a book that I have read. Ezra Levant has written a bunch of books and has gotten in trouble for previous stances that he has taken on various things, agree or disagree with him. But in this case, he's got a video that he was told not to take, which is kind of interesting, of a quote-unquote voluntary meeting between him and some elections Canada officials of some kind. He points out that the two officials they brought in were really, really high-powered interviewers. They both had former experience with the RCMP doing anti-terrorism 
interviews, which is kind of interesting. You don't really hear about that kind of interview happening so much. I wonder exactly who they have been interviewing. And the long story short is they are taking issue with the fact that he published a book during an election season. But as he pointed out, this is actually kind of common for people who are writing about politics to do here in Canada and in probably every other democratic country going back to the invention of the book. It's hard enough to get people to read, period. It's hard enough to get people interested in the democracy that they live in, that restrictions on when you can publish a book about the election is, it seems to fly right in the face of what exactly a democracy is about. Being able to be an informed voter, to be able to read up on the parties, the personalities in question, the leaders, the structure of the parties and the way that they are governed internally is something that within a democracy or at least pseudo democracy like Canada, you'd expect that we should be able to read and therefore we should also be able to write about. And yet that is exactly what they're calling him in for this interview for. He shows during the interview that there was a letter sent to him in really kind of legalese and heavy letterhead from the Elections Canada people in question in Ottawa, basically telling him to come to Ottawa for an interview or some kind of a, not exactly a trial, but a discussion. And it was made very clear in the letter that this was not going to be wise to avoid going to this meeting. So he shows up. He's not impressed, as usual. I mean, I don't imagine what they expected pulling Ezra Levant into a meeting. This guy has been in these kinds of meetings going back decades now with various parts of government telling him what he can and cannot say. And for the most part, in open, when he gets to the point where he's actually in a court rather than when there's like two sets of outcomes that have come out of him. One is that the courts have consistently allowed him to be able to speak his mind and to conduct journalism. On the other hand, they have taken issue with some of the things that he has said and perhaps even some of the things that he has done. So his his past isn't squeaky clean on that. But when he makes the claim that the he has taken the government to court recently to make sure that his journalists can go up to press events and not be just blocked from them. That's something that's probably accurate. And so in any case, he's, he's brought in front of this commission. He's asked all kinds of questions about his motivations in writing a book, which again, it's a book. It's not like, it's hard to know even what to compare this to because it's so simple of, of an action and an activity, writing a book. So Nevertheless, they're giving him all kinds of hassles for this, and they're threatening to do a lot deeper of an investigation into him and his motivations in writing this book. So it's worth, I think, at this point, going to the library and getting this book, uh, because if the federal government is that interested in squashing this book and preventing people from reading it, that they would pull the author in front of a commission and threaten him, yeah, he's a bit of a wiener. I'll, I'll agree with that <laughs> comment from the peanut gallery. But... Nevertheless, the fact that the government of Canada is pulling in an author into a meeting and saying, oh, you should have checked with us before thinking of writing this book. You should have asked our permission <laughs> to write this book, right? That's not the thing that authors in free societies generally have to do, especially during an election season. And so Elections Canada seems to have taken this, this power, this role of, of state censor onto itself. So uh, it's worth, like I said, if you have access to a public library in your city or town or wherever you live in the world, go pull it out. Ezra Levant, The Libranos is the name of the book. Don't don't pay for this. Don't give them money. But see if you can read it, because who knows? Maybe there's something interesting in it. Maybe there's some grain of truth that he stumbled upon that they're afraid that people might actually know. That seems to be the only reasonable explanation of what's going on here. The other is probably that they think he's some kind of a Russian asset. And there's also a third possibility, which nobody's really commented on yet, but I think would be perhaps tragic, but in kind of a, what is it, schadenfreude way, where there's really actually no guarantee that this is actually Elections Canada doing this interview. For all we know, it could be the RCMP who are actually doing it and doing it as part of an anti-terror uh, operation against the rebel media. This is something that the post C-51, they could actually be doing. And 
there's no reason to expect that they wouldn't do it and basically bring this this media source, this author into their, their office and then put him up under Trump charges of whatever they want to charge him with, with the expectation of perhaps lying in front of a, a court or whatever. The options are pretty open as far as under C-51 what they could do. And the reason why I bring this up is Levant was actually a supporter of Stephen Harper and his government and for the most part cheered him on as he stripped the rights of journalists and authors and publishers away, at least insofar as uh, the RCMP is able to come into their lives and arrest them without charge and put them in secret courts, uh, just like this could very well be, and not give access to lawyers, not give a due process, and, the, and just as in this case, not even tell you the charges against you, right? Uh, so th this is the sort of thing where it would be a little bit just if he was one of the examples that we could point to and say, hey, this is what's wrong with C-51, but that's going on. One of the other things going on is... Zero Hedge uh, has also been under the ban hammer. Uh, RT is unfortunately one of the only news sources talking about this. Uh, it should actually be a bigger story. Zero Hedge is not a small news site. Uh, it has been around for quite a while. I've talked about it before here. Uh, and sure, some of the things they publish, uh, you have to take with a grain of salt. But the... They are a, a source of information, and as of one day ago, they are now banned from Twitter because of something they said regarding the coronavirus and uh, apparently doxing of a Chinese scientist, which that doesn't sound like something that they would do. Maybe they did it, but what's more likely is they are just covering some bit of information as it has been happening in China, and somebody's personal information probably just got released as part of that. But let's see what RT said. Quote, the popular news blog Zero Hedge has been suspended from Twitter. While no reason was given, their last tweet referred to speculation that the coronavirus could be a bioweapon, and BuzzFeed had just accused them of doxing. So there's no guarantee that it's the last tweet that got them, by the way. When my Twitter feed got axed, it wasn't the last tweet. It was like 20 or 30 tweets back. It was recent-ish, and I don't think I really tweeted all that much that day or week relative to certainly other days and weeks. But it could have been anything. Zero Hedge has been tweeting probably since the beginning of Twitter. <laughs> like, it, it goes all the way back and has tweeted thousands and thousands of things, and any single one of them could be the thing that took them down. A uh, question from the peanut gallery. What is doxing? So doxing is releasing the personal identifying information or location of someone on the internet. So it has become part of kind of a one-two punch in that one person releases the information of somebody and a second person either sends a SWAT team or goes to the location of that person and does some kind of terrible thing to them. But just giving out personal information about someone enough to identify or locate them in the real world, that is an infringement of their privacy. And so you can think of doxing as just infringing on an individual's privacy in a perhaps social media setting, a website setting, or in the case of Zero Hedge, perhaps in a news setting. Of course, there is a little bit of a difference between the expectation of privacy of an individual who's just some guy on the internet or some woman or some girl compared to a major public figure like, I don't know, the head of the World Health Organization, for example, or the President of the United States. Uh, there is a difference in giving personal information about these kinds of people compared to just some person. There is a level of power involved when a state official or a, a person of high position of authority is involved that sometimes it makes sense to not punish doxing of them as harshly as just the doxing of some or stray random because they live with the, the kind of expectation like for example there is a secret service that defends donald trump if people know where he is at any given time that's their still their job to protect him joe blow working at mcdonald's does not have a secret service they don't have a security detail they don't have a bodyguard to protect him from the guy waiting behind the next back alley who just happens to know where he is and where he works and can figure out the path between where he lives and where he works and the routes he's going to take so there there is a harm 
in infringing someone's privacy, but the harm is different depending who it is. And that's kind of a topic we can get into deeper and deeper. But in the meanwhile, quote, the site's a zero hedge. Uh, their last tweet before the suspension referenced a paper by Indian scientists, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that part isn't all that interesting. Quote, uh, Twitter does not have to comment on reasons for suspending or banning any particular account, leaving zero hedges 673,000 or so followers in the dark on Friday afternoon. Uh, and without notifying them, I will point out, when someone gets banned from Twitter, they just disappear from everyone's feed. And you have to kind of check to see if they're still there to know that they've been banned. So for example, there's probably still followers of mine that have no idea that I've been banned and censored off of that platform as well. But with 673,000 people checking, some of them probably quite obsessively, this was noticed fairly quickly. So anyway, da, da, da. and quote, it says that it engaged in quote, abuse or harassment which doesn't seem like zero hedge at all. They could conceivably be talking about someone like Hillary Clinton, but then who knows, right? And then two hours before the suspension, BuzzFeed published a, a story accusing zero hedge, which it refers to as a popular pro-Trump website of revealing personal information of a scientist from Wuhan and quote, falsely accusing them of creating the coronavirus as a bioweapon. Release of the personal information or doxing would be a violation of Twitter rules. However, the BuzzFeed story purports to identify by name the proprietor of Zero Hedge, who writes under the pseudonym Tyler Durden. So there's a little bit of an interesting double standard there. I can't imagine uh, BuzzFeed being taken off of Twitter because they support the right guy, right? They don't, so they don't support the wrong guy. Now, let's just even assume for the moment that Zero Hedge actually supports Trump. I don't personally think they do. I think they're just celebrating and just drooling over catastrophes of any kind, of which, of course, Trump provides us with all kinds of possibilities for what could go wrong. But just even assume that they were. There's the, Trump is the president of the United States, and there's going to be a huge proportion of the American public who is going to support him, or at least his party, or at least the, that side of things, right? So cutting access to hundreds of thousands of people to their information source, even if it supports Trump, as terrible as that is, that's still like not something that Twitter should be doing at all. Uh, because with the power to do that, with the power to cut access to the support network of Donald Trump and his news, I mean, not fake news, but actual news of purveyors, it's going to, uh, one, drive, again, people underground, uh, as far as accessing even more sketchy information uh, sources. And two, it's, it's basically creating this weird unlevel playing field on Twitter where you have to be ideologically in line with the uh, CEO, for example, what is it, Jack Dorsey, and his tribe in order to even participate in a public forum or the public forum such as Twitter. Uh, let them do it to Trump if and only just Trump. See, even Trump, like if they just got rid of Trump, I, there's plenty of reasons why Trump should not be on Twitter. Like, he really does violate their rules in a big way. He is not a news source. <laughs> he is just some, well, he is a very important guy, but it's not, Zero Hedge is, has so much more going for it as a source of information that the world should have access to. It's that much more of a tragedy with uh, them being kicked off. So let's see, quote, I've reached, this is from Ryan Broderick, I've reached up to Twitter for clarity on this, but it looks like Zero Hedge may have just been suspended following my piece about them doxing uh, Chinese scientists, accusing him of what? So again, speculation from BuzzFeed. Surprise, surprise. BuzzFeed speculating on things. And then it basically says the same thing again. Let's see some complaints about BuzzFeed, which are not really relevant. But anyway, so Zero Hedge still exists. You can still access it. You can still go to their website. Uh, you can still bookmark their website. And you can still read their articles, which are usually longer than 288 characters, some of which are worth reading, some of which are not worth as much. But now that they have been banned from Twitter, if you are using Twitter, first of all, you should be considering leaving Twitter because they've been doing this more and more often to bigger and bigger targets. I don't even know if there's been a target this big that has been has gotten the cut, but they've certainly censored the voices of millions of people by this point and prevented millions of people from learning about the world from this information sources that they choose, biased or otherwise. And so instead of using Twitter, consider using the Fediverse. You can go, I'm going to leave a couple of places, links in the thread where this video is posted later. But if you just look up the Fediverse, 
Now, there's a tons of ways you, you can sign up. It's not controlled by a single entity. It's a network of networks, a federation of servers that all ideally work together. The Fediverse has its own problems with censorship, but at least it's not Twitter, and it's, at least it's not controlled by that one single point of failure that in this case is failing hard. So that is going on in the world. And you can go to Zero Hedge, of course, and bookmark it at zerohedge.com. But let's see about something on Zero Hedge, uh, which was kind of interesting today, which is, quote, China censors top local media outlet over claims Beijing is underreporting cases and deaths. So this is an example of the value of Zero Hedge. Zero Hedge can say things are happening, but in this case, they're citing their sources and the sources are pretty unimpeachable here. The first person they cite, I'm going to probably screw up his name, but he's actually a very popular person on Twitter called Balaiji S. Srinivasan. I'm pronouncing that right. At B-A-L-A-J-I-S. He does, as far as his sphere of expertise go, he's fairly reliable. And, and being aware of what's going on in the world is probably one of the things that you can count on this guy specifically to, to be doing. And so one of the things he noticed is there's an article in the uh, Kaijing, if I'm pronouncing that right, quote, one of the most re reputable outlets in China, quote, their article on the coronavirus was censored today. It claims significant utter reporting of both cases and deaths, especially among the elderly. And then he links to it. So if you can read Chinese, you can actually go to this and read it. And he provides a Google Translate link, which also seems to do a relatively good job, but who knows? So this is what the Google Translate link says, quote, people outside of the statistics. They died of, quote, general pneumonia uh, from Fang Yong Li Yu and others. Interviewed more than, or this person interviewed more than 10 family patients, most of them infected. They also support the elderly and pregnant women in various hospitals. Their families are on the front line of life and death. Quote, finance reporter Fang, quote, the Lu Mei family received a cremation note. Her mother-in-law, a 73-year-old man, huh, mother-in-law? died of breathing at home and was rushed to the hospital. My, or Lu Mai told the Kaijing reporter that the elderly had symptoms of the suspected new type of coronavirus pneumonia on January 21st. And the diagnosis re results showed that the lung was highly infected in the fourth hospital of Wuhan. However, the old man has not been admitted to several hospitals and can only isolate himself at home until his illness. Uh, after the old man was taken to the ambulance, family never saw her see again gender clashes here. So there's definitely some translation issues here. But all they received was a cremation note indicating the cause of death in the elderly was viral pneumonia. However, according to family members, the death of the elderly was not included in the number of confirmed deaths from new coronary pneumonia because she probably that that should be probably translated as coronavirus quote, because she did not qualify for hospitalization and was not diagnosed with new coronary probably again, coronavirus, until her death and could only be counted as general pneumonia, the unfortunate one who died. So long story short, this article is about the cases that are not being counted as part of the official numbers. And if you're watching the official numbers, which I'll leave a, a link to a place where you can do that, you'll notice that they've kind of tapered off in the past day or two, which can be explained by one of about two things. One is that the epidemic is slowly starting to get under control and that the number of people dying and getting better and getting it are, are slowly starting to taper off. Or the other alternative is that the healthcare system in China, where most of these cases are still being reported, is at the straining point or the breaking point and the doctors can't keep up with the new number of patients coming in. They're telling them to go home and to isolate themselves and not seeing them. And for whatever reason, the numbers aren't being tallied appropriately. Now, which of those two things is true? You'd have to have someone on the ground in China to know. And the problem here is, and this is something that I've learned from speaking with people who have contacts in China, is the government of China is censoring people's ability to communicate about this. So if you, even if you did have uh, someone in China that you know that you could get information about this, it's very likely that if they're in Wuhan, that information is not coming out to the outside world. The people who don't have access to the Tor network, for example, are not getting access to the outside world. 
They're not telling the rest of us what's going on. So there is some uncertainty in who to believe. And this is a problem. I've seen some complaints that the government of China is starting to kind of get in the way of scientific research. I've talked a little bit about the, in the last video how it seemed like the scientific world is jumping on this and moving very quickly in understanding the, the nature of the virus and how it's spreading, etc. But we're starting to see official state censorship being used in China. And as mentioned, uh, they are where more, most of the cases are. And so when there's censorship of something like this, we all we're left with is speculation. And all we're left with is sources like Zero Hedge, who are at least bothering to go out and contact and learn about what's going on. And so what are the official numbers or what are the real numbers? Who knows? So here, here's some more quote from Srinivasan. Quote, key points. Some of the deaths are being recorded as general pneumonia. Two, there's a lack of test kits to verify what's going on. Uh, three, people are going home to die. Four, there are seven hospitals with no beds. That's as recent as yesterday at 10.39 p.m. Granted, they're building hospitals. I saw something on Facebook saying they've already built two new hospitals uh, since this epidemic began. Who knows what the actual number is, but it's understandable with 16,000 plus uh, maybe up to 100,000 people sick that the hospitals are overrun, or at least were overrun at one point. Who knows what the status is currently, quote. But the key quote here is, quote, the number of confirmed and fatal cases that people can see does not fully reflect the full picture of the epidemic. So uh, let's see here. And then it links to a video, which is not all that interesting. But the point here is that whatever the numbers we're seeing here, it does seem that this is a lower bound of this official count. So let's see what the, the number is actually right now. Uh, we can bring this up. It's I, I haven't seen anything suggesting it's still over the 100,000 mark, but the GIS data, ArcGIS Open Dashboard, put on by John Hopkins University is saying 16,831 confirmed cases. So it's probably over that. But uh, that's one of the things that's going on in the world. Let's see what else we got going on. Uh, I think actually this is about the time I was going to uh, play... Now, normally I'd play a song at this point, a Creative Commons or freely shareable song. I will point out, though, I did make a mistake last week, and this is the first mistake, so hopefully there's not any more of those going in my archives. But the, I thought Ninja Spark was one of the 8-bit peoples, and 8-bit peoples released a huge trove of 8-bit music to the world for free, and I thought that Ninja Spark was among them. And in my audio player, it was listed with a bunch of the eight, other 8-bit eight music, or 8-bit people's 8-bit music, and unfortunately it was not. Uh, so I have to, uh, I'm sorry Ninja Spark, if you're out there, I didn't mean to include you with the 8-bit peoples and classify your song incorrectly. YouTube and Facebook both have removed that video anyway, so I don't think there's very much harm in the reach that it got. But nevertheless, I do try to have something for the rest of you to enjoy that you can freely share. Unfortunately, that's probably not one of them. But the other thing that happened this week is I got a reply from episode 48. Episode 48 was uh, similarly censored. Google saw the... I had two songs on episode 38. Uh, one, I actually got a written permission from the copyright holder that I would be able to include it. The other was just a general Creative Commons song, uh, part of a Wired CD released in 2004 to showcase what Creative Commons could do. Unfortunately, YouTube's content ID got hit on that, and I appealed the video, and as usual, as my previous appeals have mostly gone, the appeal goes to a copyright collection agency of some kind, and that agency has denied my request. So that video is going to stay off of YouTube for the time being, and you'll have to go to other sources of media to listen to that particular episode. And then the other thing that happened this week, of course, is my MP3 player died. So normally I'd have some music to listen to during the week so I can give you something after kind of sorting through what the, the good stuff is and what isn't. Unfortunately, this week I do not have that. So I'm going to have to go a little bit into my archives and pull something out. And what I'm going to pull out here and play for you isn't actually a song. It is a meditation timer or a meditation. Now, I've already played two of these in the past on, I believe, one of them on this show before in one of the er very, very early episodes. It was like episode two or three. And, but I haven't played the third one yet. And so how this is going to work is I'm going to give more instructions on how to do meditation and what to do. 
perhaps later. But the first three you don't get instructions for. You just have to listen to them like you'd listen to any song and to just listen, I guess. To do nothing but listen, perhaps. I don't want to give too much more instruction than that. This is going to be a little bit of a longer one, just a heads up, but we're going to do this together. So if you're doing something, perhaps keep doing it, but if you're not doing something, perhaps just don't do something for a while. So let's see how this works and hopefully you enjoy and I'll catch you after the interlude.